As I've mentioned previously, Minsky is a very good platform for modeling complex systems in general. So I haven't, still haven't got to what's special about Minsky compared to other programs, but it does, I think, do these sorts of things much better. So this model you're looking at now is Lorenz's model of the weather. If you've heard about the Lorenz butterfly, you'll soon see why it's called a butterfly. And the equations in this model are extremely simple. Um, let's just see if I can highlight them over here. Thank you. Okay. You simply have three variables and three constants. Constants A, B, and C. Uh, variables X, Y, and Z. The oh, actually, I'll just drag this over so I can see it more clearly. Okay. The X equation is the X dt equals A times Y minus X. The Y equation is X times B minus Z minus Y. The Z equation is X times Y minus C times Z. Now, looking at that set of equations, um, you wouldn't, you would not expect to see complex behaviour come out of something so simple. And that's precisely the attitude that Lorenz had when he first derived these equations by taking the, uh, it's not quite the Navier-Stokes model, but it's a particular model of fluid dynamics, which is an extremely complicated set of partial differential equations, and stripped it down to the bare essentials because what he was trying to, win, uh, to illustrate to his fellow meteorologists back in the early 60s, 1963, uh, was that their modelling approaches were linear, and the fundamental variables in the weather were nonlinear. So they were bound to be wrong by using a linear methodology for it was fundamentally a nonlinear system. But the nonlinearity of the overall system was incredibly complicated, far too hard to see. So he decided to strip it down, uh, taking that set of equations and produce a set of first order uh, ordinary differential equations and then see what the behaviour was. And he expected to see cycles, which indeed he did. So let's do one run here. Now, of course, he was seeing a computer printout with a set of numbers on it, nothing quite as uh, visual as what you're seeing right now. But as you can see, the X and the Y and the Z values never settle down to equilibrium. If we use this chart here, and let's actually uh, zoom in, if I choose expand, and I can see it on a larger scale, and let's also... I hate how you got to get one bloody pixel right on a 2,000 by 4,000 resolution screen. Okay, let's go this way, first of all, and then let's go this way. Okay, there are three equilibrium in the system. One is the zero, zero position. I'm not quite certain where that is in the chart, probably down here. Uh, but the other two are here and here. And as you can tell, the system is never anywhere near them. It starts over here and then gets blasted around by the dynamics of the system, rotates around one equilibrium, then without uh, any particular obvious pattern to it, blasts over to the other equilibrium, rotates around there for a while, and then disappears again. So if I actually just uh, go back and run the simulation, you can see this writ large quite literally in that chart. Mesmerising, isn't it? Let's let it run for a while. Obviously being repelled by that particular equilibrium. And if you're a linear thinker, you might think the repulsion will lead to it breaking down, going to impossible values. But no, it suddenly changes direction and cycles around the other equilibrium, equally also unstably. It's moving away from it. And as it happens, the third equilibrium is also unstable. Now, you might think, oh, yeah, okay, back around this one. This is one reason why I wanted to have that little block leading the simulation so you could actually see where you were up to on a simulation rather than losing it with all the um, overwritten uh, lines that develop out of a simulation like this. And boom, around the other one. And on it will go, and if I ran the simulation forever, it would never reach any of the three equilibria because they are all unstable. And this is one thing that neoclassicals in general simply haven't got their heads around, uh, that you can have equilibria in a system which are not stable, but the system doesn't break down. Again, their understanding is largely taken from thinking about the economy in a linear way, and it's not a linear system, and I'll show that uh, in one of the next um, example videos. So one that'll go, that'll go on forever, and it will never reach equilibrium. I'll just shut that window down because that'll speed up the simulation over here. So on we go. So that's point one. Now point, so then that's also just showing that you can use Minsky for simulating any complex system model which is scalar-based. So having done that, let's just take a look at another model of pretty much the same thing. The reason being, this little uh, exchange, I, I spoke at a function of, 
a it was a stunt. And anybody who thinks we were actually trying to replicate uh, Martin Luther's actual theses, please, it was just using the, the hook that it's 500 years since Martin Luther wrote his thesis to say there's a need for a reformation in economics as well. And just before I wrote it, uh, this Professor Reese, who's at the LS, uh, not LSE, he's at the, um, I think he's at the London School of Economics, uh, in making a defence of neoclassical DSGE modelling, came out with a statement that you can see right here, comparing macroeconomic forecasts to a forecast of average temperature or precipitation over the next one to five years, as opposed to over the next few days, it is far from clear that economic forecasting is doing so poorly. Well, if he'd actually understood the complex system of literature, he'd never said anything so stupid, stayed away, because 50 years earlier, uh, Lorenz made this point, that when you have a nonlinear system, uh, given the instability of the flows, prediction of a sufficiently distant future is impossible by any method unless present conditions are known exactly. And I want to use Minsky to illustrate that's right now. So what I have here is a model where I have two statements of the same model, same initial conditions, same constants. This is all in terms of x, y, and z. This is in terms of x1, y1, and z1. They're the same equations. If I run the simulation, starting from the same initial conditions, the x values are glued to each other. They'll never never deviate. And this particular, the bottom graph here, which is graphing x versus and, and x1 over time, will always be stuck absolutely together. Now, what can people who don't know complex systems, and that unfortunately includes most of the economics profession thinks is that if you have a slight difference in your initial conditions, you'll have a slight error that grows slightly over time. In complex systems, that slight error goes exponentially over time, as Lorenz pointed out way back in 1963. And even the tiniest difference between the initial conditions will lead to the simulations being completely different in a finite length of time. So I'll illustrate that here. You'll notice that with the, the T value here, if I just edit and bring up and show how T is defined, T uh, starting at 10 minus 10, the same, which is the same as the initial condition for the other model, and I can vary it by steps of 0.0001. That's a tiny difference um, in precision, the sort of thing you'd normally, if, if you got that close to the value of an economic variable, you'd be cock a hoop happy, you wouldn't worry that it's just a tiny difference apart. But in a complex system, that makes an enormous difference. So I'm just going to tap the arrow key once to change the value now. It doesn't turn up there, unfortunately, but if we go to edit, you, know, you can see the value there is 10 minus 10.0001, so a tiny difference with the initial initial condition. I haven't actually run this yet to test it beforehand, but I'm pretty confident I know what's going to happen. On we go. Hmm. Russell, we have a problem. I should have changed, I should have deviated by now. Let's see. Oh, I've got to start this whole fucking thing again. What a drag. Let's just stop that. Because I should have deviated. Okay, what's that? Is it 10 point... Minus 10.0001? Okay, let's just check here. Initial condition versus initial condition... Oh, bloody hell. Okay, that's what's going on. All right, I'm going to leave that live. This is the sort of thing you learn by. I copied that variable down here, and as I've showed you earlier, modifying one modifies the other. So I've changed them both by the same amount. Let's actually solve that. I'm going to delete that, bring in another constant, and make this minus, hang on, again, the arrow key positioning, um, minus 10. Okay, so let's now click that there. Like this here, drag that up. So that's minus 10. This one is minus 10.0001. Okay, let's roll this again. Ah, oh, shit. Ah, oh, here we go. Right, starting to deviate. Boom! After 15 seconds, you have a completely different system. You simply don't know from the previous system, where the system differing by 0 0.0001 is going to go. That's the basis of complex systems. And that's the point that Lorenzo realised 50 years ago. And clearly, economists who think they know dynamic modelling do not know the essentials of complex systems, which is one of the reasons why I say what a, 
neoclassical economist who is not in mathematics, it's mythematics. Um, they are just not up to date with the, with the latest mathematical techniques. And it's one of the reasons my, my criticism of economics is actually not saying that the mathematics is wrong to be used in the first place. They're simply using the wrong sort of mathematical techniques for modeling complex systems. So, okay, our little problem solved. Let's just save that model and I'll show a few more complex systems models. So another uh, one that matters is, let's see where I've got that. Ah, I thought I put the double pendulum. Here we go, double pendulum. Okay, this is a model of a pendulum with a, with a um, point in the middle that rotates. So rather than a single pendulum, you just get, you know, boring metronome behavior. A bit like watching Andy Murray play uh, Djokovic in tennis, two metronomes bashing each other up. Um, what I've got here with uh, this model is a model of a single pendulum which has a rotation point and you're asking what is the position and the angle, position of this particular point in space and the angle between the two. How does that behave over time? Now this is a, uh, it's, a it's shown as a single differential equation but it's non-linear. Uh, you can see I've got cosines and sines etc etc. Uh, omega, I think I've got squared turns turning up there. It's so uh, as you read, you can read. It, it takes a while to read the equation, but it's saying the rate of change of the omega value, and I've got the rate of change of the. Let's see, what's the other one? The omega value, rate of change of the angle is omega. The rate of change of omega is this. You've got sines, cosines, etc., etc., multiplied by each other. Now, what do you get out of that? Do you get a predictable motion? Obviously, a metronome is absolutely predictable. Uh, what happens with a double metronome? Let's run this and see what happens. A program like VizSim, by the way, does a better job than this because VizSim actually lets you link up to a mock-up of a double pendulum and you actually see the actual motion taking place on screen. So VizSim definitely is better for this uh, than just seeing the mathematical numbers for the, the, um, for the simulation. But you can see that it is an incredibly complex pattern out of a deterministic model. There is no exogenous shock here. It is simply the behavior of a deterministic model, which is complex. Chaotic system, incredibly simple equation, rather more complicated than the Renz's, but still only with you know, about 10 or so terms. Actually, how many parameters we got there? Let's see, click over here and take a look. So we have um, yeah, 0.5, 1, 2, 3, 3 parameters and 2 variables. So pretty simple, but nonlinear. And what you get, let's actually continue running it. It's slowing down because of the sheer amount of, of detail in building the model. You can see that, they, that that's the location. Again, makes a big difference, that little dot there, but Minsky is the only program to have that. Uh, showing where you're going on this complex system, and there's no repeating whatsoever going on here. There's, there's no two values will ever occur uh, at the same time of the two variables, omega and theta. Uh, it's a complex system. It will continue building out that complicated pattern forever. I'll just bring it back and get it going faster. Minsky does have a few problems with speed when we flip between one visual display and another. So that system is very close, you'll, you'll notice, you'll think, uh, but in fact the, the time values never uh, overlap with each other, they're always uh, slightly different. And you've got about five or six layers to the location, the interaction of omega and theta in this particular model. Deterministic model, complex, apparently chaotic behavior but deterministic. And so I think it goes there's about um, five or six thick layers that turn up for thick locations of the interaction of the two variables. I think it goes one up there, let's see, at some point. You could never, you, you, this is, I don't know why casinos haven't started gambling on this front, there'd be a fair bit of money to be made. All right, okay, there's another layer turning up there. And I think another one, if I live it for long enough, another, uh, dominant aperiodic uh, component turns up in the cyclicality of omega with uh, with theta. So that's another one. Let's check another one out. Okay, back over here. Another complex system. I think I've got those two. Yeah, I'll leave that because in the next stage I'm finally going to start talking about uh, what is special about Minsky, which is its capacity to model financial flows.